George R. R. Martin uses hair color in an interesting way in his books. More than just a small detail that helps create a mental picture of these characters, the color of their hair is sometimes a critical plot point. In fact, the mystery of the first season is entirely dependent on this detail, and according to some theories, the color of the hair of certain characters foreshadows revelations about their parentage in the coming books. Much like our own ancestors, the people of Westeros may not have known about the specifics of DNA or sequencing, but they do understand the core principle of genetic inheritance. Traits are passed down from one generation to the next. One of the ways through which they verify this assumption is by observing hair color. So I thought it would be fun to try and understand how the genetics of hair color works in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire. For the purposes of this exercise, I'll attempt to create a model that explains how hair color is determined in Westeros. We will consider that there are four broad groups of hair color. Silver hair, dark hair, which could be black or brown, blonde, and red hair. For now, we won't consider nuances of hair tone, such as the difference between lighter and darker shades of brown. There are two concepts we need before we begin, but they are very easy to understand. Locus and allele. A locus is a specific region in the genome. Let's call this the hair color locus. This region contains a hair color gene, and this gene has different versions. Each of these versions is called an allele. Since Westeros has four broad categories of hair color, let's say that there's one allele for each of them. The silver hair allele, responsible for the silver golden hair of those of Valyrian origin, the dark allele, which makes black or brown hair, the blonde allele, and the red allele. Let's start by having a look at the Valyrian allele. Each one of us inherits two copies of each gene, one from our mother and one from our father. So it's easy to understand that if a child inherits two Valyrian alleles, one from the mom and one from the dad, they'll have silver hair. But what happens if a child inherits different alleles from each of their parents? Well, that's when the notion of dominance comes into play. In our case, because we have four possible alleles, there is a hierarchy of dominance, where one is stronger than all, the second is weaker than the first, but stronger than the rest, and so on. And the hair color will follow the stronger allele. The classical example of this kind of hierarchy in the real world are blood types. There are three alleles for the ABO group system, A, B, and O. A and B are co-dominant over O. This means that when each of them appears alongside an O allele, they will dictate the blood type. So a child with an A allele and an O allele will have blood type A, while a child with two O alleles will have blood type O. When A and B appear together, both are expressed, giving rise to the AB blood type. Now let's go back to Astros. What would be the hierarchy of hair color alleles? Well, I think I can make a case for the Valyrian allele to be dominant over all the others. We know that Targaryens often marry brothers and sisters, so it's not surprising that most of their offspring has the silver hair of their line. However, we also know bastard children of the Targaryen house, the dragon seeds, also sport silver golden hair. Considering that the Valyrian allele didn't exist in Westeros prior to their emigration from Old Valyria, the only way this is possible is if the Valyrian allele is dominant over all the others, thus overriding their expression. This explains how people like Hugh Hammer, Silver Dennis, and Alan of Ho have have silver hair, despite having only one parent able to pass on the Valyrian allele. What about Rhaenyra's first three sons, Princess Jaceres, Luceres, and Joffrey? We know their father is probably Sor Harwin Strong, but even then, shouldn't they inherit the Valyrian allele from their mother? Well, not necessarily. Rhaenyra is the daughter of King Viserys II and Queen Emma, who was born Emma Arryn. Emma was daughter of Roderick Arryn, so we know she has at least one allele that's not Valyrian, probably a blonde allele, considering her father. She could have passed that allele on to her daughter, Rhaenyra. So Rhaenyra has one Valyrian allele from her father and one blonde allele from her mother. She can only pass one of those to her sons. So if each of them got a blonde allele from her and a dark allele from their father, and if the dark allele is second in the hierarchy of dominance, their hair would be dark, which is what ended up happening. Now, the mathematical nerds watching this might be thinking, the proportions are wrong. According to this model, 50% of her children, at least one of her three boys, should have silver hair. And that is mathematically true. But in the real world, human beings rarely have enough children for these proportions, which we call Mendelian proportions, to manifest exactly. Therefore, 
It is entirely feasible that a couple with this genetic background would have three children with dark hair. It happens all the time. The same reason we used for Rhaenyra's children would explain Jon Snow's dark hair. Jon would have inherited a dark allele from his mother, Lyanna Stark, and a non-Valyrian allele from his father, Rhaegar, the last dragon. Rhaegar would have inherited his non-Valyrian allele from his great-grandmother, Betha Blackwood. Okay, but if the Valyrian allele is dominant over all the others, in other words, if only a single copy is sufficient for the person to have silver hair, then doesn't that mean that silver hair should be the most common hair color in Westeros? Not necessarily. The reason why this hair color is unusual is because it was only introduced in the population after the Valyrians migrated into the country. Their number was not large, and they often intermarried, so the degree of mixing with the Westerosi population was minimal. When they did mix, the life of a dragon seed was not always devoid of risk. As Olf White points out, a dragon seed must watch his own neck when he has no white-clothed guardsmen to do it for him. This brings us to the rest of the hierarchy. The most common hair color in Westeros appears to be dark, so I would posit that the dark allele is dominant over blonde and red. Let's have a look at the stocks. Assuming that red is the weakest of all alleles, in order for someone to have red hair, they would need to have two copies of the red allele. That would be the case of Kathleen Stock. Ned, we know, has dark hair. We also know that the two of them have children with both brown and red hair. So what does that tell us? Well, in that case, we know that Ned must have one red allele. All children will have at least one red allele from their mother. When Ned passes on his dark allele, the child's hair is brown. When he passes on the red allele, they are red-haired. Once again, the color of the children's hair strays from the 50-50% we would expect, but with so few children, these numbers are entirely acceptable. I made an assumption there that the blonde allele is dominant over the red, but in truth we don't have enough information to make a determination here. There is only one couple we know from the books that could be informative. John and Lisa Aring. John had the blonde hair of the Lords of the Vale, and Lisa the same red hair as her sister, Kathleen. According to my model, their son, Sweet Robin, should have either blonde or red hair, and one of those might have given us a clue over which one is dominant over the other. Sweet Robin's hair, however, is brown. So does that break this theory? Well, it could, but I offer two possible explanations. The first is a genetic one. It is possible that during the embryonic stage, Sweet Robin developed a new mutation. So he inherited a blonde and a red allele from each of his parents, but through mutation, one of them became a dark allele, and for that reason, his hair is dark. This is genetically possible. It's what's called a de novo mutation, and every person has one or two of these in their protein coding genes. A second explanation, and I dare say a more likely one, is that John Aaron is not Sweet Robin's father. We know that the couple had trouble conceiving a child, that Liza had five miscarriages and two stillborn children, so it's not inconceivable to think that her one child is a product of an extramarital affair. We also know she was in love with another man, one that, like Sweet Robin, has dark hair. And she did say they had their wedding night years ago. This model of multi-allelic inheritance seems to explain most of the hair color variation in Westeros. But there's still a mystery to be solved. What about the Baratheons? Robert Baratheon had 16 biological children, all of whom had dark hair. How is this possible? Well, one explanation is that Robert was homozygous for the dark allele. That is, he had two copies of the dark allele, so he always passed that on. And if none of his children's mothers had a Valyrian allele, then all of them would have dark hair. This is possible. You don't see a lot of silver hair in Westeros after the rebellion. But it's not just about Hobart, is it? We know that all Baratheon men, since the start of their line, had black hair. It's too much to assume that for 300 years, this happened by chance alone. Now this is where things get fun. The explanation I propose is that there is a second locus relevant to hair color. Let's call this the hair shade locus. This locus has several genes that are so close to each other that they are always passed on together. This is called a haplotype. Most people in Westeros have two copies of a weak haplotype here. When this happens, hair color is determined by the hair color locus, as we've seen before, and nothing changes. The Baratheon, however, have a strong haplotype in the hair shade locus. When present, 
this haplotype overrides anything expressed by the hair color locus, and the child's hair is black. This is what is called epistatic dominance. A gene in one place is dominant over a gene in another place. But this still doesn't explain how is it that Baratheon men seem to always pass on the strong haplotype. In order for that to happen, the strong haplotype must have a toxic effect on sperm carrying the weak haplotype. This means that when the strong haplotype is present, only sperm carrying the strong haplotype would survive, and that would be the only haplotype passed on to the next generation. According to this model, all children of Baratheon men would have black hair, as well as 50% of children of Baratheon women. How would this have started? It is possible that this haplotype arose by spontaneous mutation in Oris Baratheon, the first of his line, and that it has been passed on from one generation to the next ever since. Oris was a general in the army of Aegon the Conqueror. He was rumored to be Aegon's bastard brother. But my theory actually opens up a new possibility. Perhaps Oris was never a bastard. He might have been a legitimate second son, spurred by his family because he was born with dark hair. I have no idea if these were the actual rules of inheritance George R. R. Martin imagined for his word in real life. There are many different genes involved in hair color, and in all likelihood, many more genes would have to be involved in that in Westeros as well. Be that as it may, I think trying to figure out how it works was a fun exercise, and I think it would be a useful world building too, especially when genetics plays such a big part in the plot. It's really cool being able to merge genetics and fiction. Just giving the final touches in the video. Ah, uh, so. Raise the no. tankard high, my friend, where tales and laughter never end. The fire roars, the elders flow, in this fine hall where spirits glow. Oh, sing a tune and clap your hand, where the merriest lots in all the land. Through mead and wine our voices blend, in the tavern's heart where nights transcend.